Ron, lovely to see you again. Yeah, good to Welcome see you. Welcome to Australia. Well, thank you. Uh, is this your first time at GCAP? Uh, no, I've been to GCAP twice before. And what do you think the importance of days like today are? I think it's important just because you get a lot of developers together, right? And they can talk their craft and their creative trade and, you know, share stories and a lot of camaraderie in that. And I think that's really important to do. And how have you seen this conference develop over the last few years? Um, I guess it was much smaller the first year that I, I came to it. It seems like it's uh, you know it's like a real conference. We got banners, you know, yeah, up on yeah, the thing the stands and stuff. Yeah, and stuff so yeah. you know, yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a lot of fun. I'm having a great time. You were at the first GDC. Were you at the first GDC? GDC? No, I was. I was. I was at the first GDC that was not in Chris Crawford's living room. Yeah, right. Okay. Right. So was the at, first time it was in a hotel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. And so, what was that experience like compared to what you know GDC and, and GCAP, what these kind of uh, events are today? Well, I would say it's actually fairly similar to what GCAP is, right? I think the first GDC I went to, there were maybe 400 people that came to it. And, and I remember it was like we all had dinner. I mean, everybody that attended GDC had dinner in the same room together. Yeah, right, right? just at one table. Yeah, yeah and, and you know, today GDC is, what, 25,000 people, right? There's no way we could all have dinner in the same room. So it was a, it was a much smaller, you know, experience. Um, you know, much, much like this is, much like Jeep Gap is, you know, where you can really meet everybody that's at the conference and you can, you know, have a lot of fun and stuff. But you think these conferences have retained the sort of ideals and, and heart that they had originally? I think, you, well, I think originally, um, I mean, I think the ideals are, are pretty much the same, right? The goal is to kind of educate developers. And, but I think it changes from, you know, the original GDC and probably what GCAP is right now is it's, I think it's more of a, of a you know, confined social experience, right? Because there are a lot less people. So you could go around and talk to everybody, right? I could have a conversation with everybody at GCAP over the next day, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but you cannot do that at GDC. So I think they, I think, you know, conferences, when they get above a certain amount, they kind of grow into something a little bit different. And I think, you know, GCAP is still at that level that it's a really nice, personal, more, you know, intimate uh, experience. So it's almost like grab onto the opportunity now mm -hmm. while you can still meet yeah. everybody. Yeah, because if it's gone, you know, it's, it's gone and you can't have that. You know, it's like I would love to have a GDC experience. It was more like the original GDCs, but those days are just gone, you know, but you can kind of get that at the smaller conferences like this. And the theme of this GCAP is standing on the shoulders of giants. And, and I think pretty much everyone here would agree you are one of those giants. Do you feel like one of the giants? No, not at all. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't feel that way at all. I mean, I know a lot of people, you know, played Monkey Island and played a lot of my games and really enjoyed them. And a lot of developers come up and, you know, tell me, Yo, you're, the, you know, you're the reason I, you know, make games today. And I feel like I have to apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry for that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't feel like that. I don't feel like that at all. Do you feel like you can go around here and you're still learning things? Yo, yeah, you always learn stuff. You know, it's like... Um, you know, games are not the same as, you know, when I started making games, right? They've just always evolved and changed. So, you know, you're constantly dealing with new stuff, right? You're dealing with, you know, mobile games, which are tracking a different audience. They have a different, you know, way that they make money through the other purchases. I mean, that's all stuff that I'm not intimately familiar with. So you go and you listen to talks and you do, you know, you always learn stuff. I think you always have to be learning. I, I would not be still making games if I wasn't learning because it just wouldn't be enjoyable anymore. And I mean, you mentioned that you've been making games for, for you know, um, it's 32 years. Yeah, uh, look, I, I, I didn't want to say a huge amount of time. 32 years, that, that, that sounds much better. Uh, what's changed for developers besides just the tools that they're using? Well, I think that it's development has actually kind of come full circle, which is really interesting, right? Because when I started, it was very small teams of people. Like Maniac Mansion was built by three people, right? That was a team of three people built that game. And then, you know, team sizes started growing and growing and growing, and then you got these, you know, 100, 200 people teams that were needed. But then it's kind of come full circle again, right? Because now we have this vibrant, you know, indie game market, and you're back to these teams of, you know, two or three people can actually make a really interesting, successful game. So it's kind of come full circle, and that to me is, is very exciting. Because I feel like that speaks into your ethos, uh, from what I can tell from the outside, as a developer, where you love this sort of smaller, more control, more collaboration than just being a cog 
in a bigger machine? Yeah, very much so. I, I don't work well on, on big teams, right? I think I think one of my weaknesses is I'm, I'm a really bad communicator when it comes to communicating out with a large team of people. Like, I'm really good when it's a small team of people and we can all just kind of shoot the shit about what the game is and what the vision is and we all kind of hold the vision in a way. But I think when, it, when the team starts to get big like that, it's like I personally kind of start to break down in my ability to communicate out with a large team of people. So I very much enjoy smaller teams of people. I mean, that's funny that you say it's come full circle because you know so many people here are working in teams of themselves or just one or two people. What advice do you have for them having, having gone through that period, gone to the big teams and, and now you're back to these small small groups. Well, what it really excites me about small teams, and I, you know, I saw this in the early games that I did, you know, things like Maniac and Mansion and Monkey Island, is those were very much like improv games to me, right? It was almost doing like improv. Like, we didn't really have a design document, right? I had like a couple of pages I'd written about Monkey Island, right? I, I knew where the story was going to go, but I didn't really know what the game was, right? And so it was really, it's, a, it's about getting those small teams together and just iterating. And just, you know, you have a really fun idea at lunch and it's in the game in the afternoon, right? You can't do that when you have 200 people working on the game. You can't have a fun idea at lunch and have it in the game that <laughs> afternoon, yeah. right? There's a whole machine that has to, like, you have to start turning the crank. And that's why I like the small teams. And I think that's the advantage that the smaller indie developers have is they can react very quickly to things, right? They can see something in the morning and have it in the game in the afternoon and you know, be iterating, reacting to that. And I think that's, that's their strength. And so how have you taken advantage of this? Thimbleweed Park's coming out pretty soon. Yeah, er uh, early next year. Yeah, and so how, how have you developed with the change of the industry and how and how you make games yourself. Well, I think where we park very much is kind of an improv game. You know, it's like Gary and I knew where we wanted the story to go. We had the basic setting and all of that. But, you know, a lot of the details don't get figured out until we start iterating on them. And, you know, anyone on the team, you know, has a weird idea and we go, oh, that's a really good idea. And we get it in a game. Why not? You know, it's a fun idea, right? If it, if it fits in the framework of the vision of the game, you know, you put stuff in. So there's a lot of stuff that we've done, even late in the process, right? Because we're, you know, content complete, we're a text lock, we're past all those things. But even... You know, a couple of weeks before that, somebody has a really cool idea. It's like, okay, that's a good idea. We just scramble to get it in the game because it's a really good idea. And is that stuff that's now just way easier to do because of the tech? Yeah, it is. I mean, I think the big difference between, you know, making games when I started now is just the tool set, right? I mean, we had to build every tool we used ourselves because there was no Unity. There was, you know, none of this stuff out there. You know, there, there weren't even like Microsoft compilers for C, right? It's like we're doing everything in assembly language. And, you know, today there's just wonderful tools for people to use. You know, you don't have to be a really excellent programmer Programmer to be able to put together a really interesting game, and, and I think that's a that's a huge advantage. What what rumblings in the industry, whether it's tools or themes or where it's headed, has got you excited recently? You're about to finish off this game, and I'm sure you have ten other ideas for other stuff. What what direction do you want to explore next? Yeah, I don't really know. I, I actually don't have ten ideas. I don't. Oh, I've got some for you. <laughs> <We've got> some. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't tend to think a lot about my next game while I'm working my current game. Yeah. I usually finish my current game and then I'll kind of start thinking about my next game. I think I have absolutely no interest in VR. Oh, absolutely none whatsoever. Okay, why is absolutely that? none? Because I think I think twenty. 25 years from now, VR will be an amazing thing that will rule our lives. Mm. I think that it is 25 years off. I think putting uh, a big pair of goggles on your head that you know are all sweaty from the last person that used them, I just think there's, there's no mass market appeal. And I think the technology is really cool, right? Because I sometimes express my skepticism about VR and the first thing people say is, oh, well, have you seen it? And it's like, yes, I <laughs> yes, have, I, seen, I it. have <laughs> seen it. It's amazing, right? It is absolutely amazing. But there's just no way that you're going to put this big clunky thing on your face and people are going to exist in that. It's, it's not mass market. It's a long way from being mass market. When it's in my contact lenses, yeah, yeah. that's when it's mass market. That's so but until that point, it's a, it's a really cool technology that has 
25 years to being mature. That is so that is so great because I mean that's how I feel as well. But I've, I've interviewed so many people and I find it so hard to get them to say what it is they like about VR beyond the fact that it's this cool experience. But it seems like lots of people can't necessarily back it up with ideas of how to utilize this in a way that can get everybody on board. It is that sort of like you've got this great PC you can put on this expensive headset and do it for an hour and a half before you start feeling sick. Do you, do you feel like there are uh, other platforms or mediums that we should be exploring? Because I feel like storytelling in video games has so, such a long way to go before we're necessarily like changing up all the tech that we're using. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't tend to be driven a lot on kind of technological changes. Yeah, it doesn't really drive you know what I'm doing. It's like to me, you know, what interests me about games are the changing audience, right? I, th I think games went through a really interesting change when the iPhone came out. Not because you particularly like mobile games, but it opened games up to this mass audience, right? There are people who had never thought about playing games before who are obsessive about playing games on their mobile phones now, right? And it's not that I necessarily want to make a mobile game for them, but I think it's interesting that you know, being a, a gamer and playing games isn't a stigma anymore, right? Everybody does it. I mean, grandmothers do it. You know, presidents of countries do it. <laughs> yeah. Everybody does it now. And to me, that is what is so interesting. It's it's more of the social changes that come about uh, from games rather than the technology ones that interest me. And with a game like Thimbleweed Park, are you speaking to an audience that already like adventure games that are like the games that you play? Are you trying to find a new audience? Uh, because I feel like these days you can target these sort of niche groups if you, if you want. Well, certainly that's important to us, right? Because there are there is a group of people who love you know, point-and-click adventures and love you know, the era of the LucasArts type point-and-click adventures. But I think the market is much bigger than that, right? I think, I think there are a lot of people who would enjoy a really good kind of interesting, you know, puzzle and story game. And so, you know, doing Thimbleweed Park, it's like we're pulling a lot of the, the roots of the stuff that we did back in the LucasArts stuff, but definitely trying to make a game that's going to appeal to a lot more people than just the hardcore. So we've got a whole bunch of upcoming, promising young developers or people who've worked in the industry for ages. Where do you want this group here today to be taking video games? I, I think it's it's interesting if they take it in directions that I just haven't thought of, right? If, if, I, if I've thought of it, then it's probably not an interesting direction. It's like, you know, like I said before, I've been working in this business for like 32 years, right? And I have a whole bunch of experience. But I think that experience can also be, you know, a, a detriment in a lot of ways because it's like I, I often don't think of the of the completely bizarre ideas, right? It's like I think anybody that has a lot of experience, you know, you tend to filter too quickly. You tend to hear a weird idea and go, well, that's not going to work. I have yeah. years of experience. I have hundreds of examples why this won't work. So we shouldn't pursue this. Where I think you know, people, young people in any industry, right, whether they're filmmakers or authors or anything. They don't have that experience, so they do pursue the weird ideas, right? And a thousand, you know, 99, 99, 999 times out of a thousand, they, they go nowhere. But that one time, it's like, it's magical because they do something that is really, really interesting. So, you know, my advice to anybody is like, chase weird ideas. It's like, don't, don't look at what's selling and try to deconstruct that into what worked and didn't work and then make your game try to be successful. Chase crazy ideas, because those are the ones that are gonna be really, really interesting. And not to put you on the spot, but what was the last game you played where you went crazy idea that totally worked? Oh, probably the Stanley Parables. Yeah. I mean, that game just blew my mind, right? Because when I play a game, you know, as a, as a game developer, the first thing I do when that game boots up is I try to break it, right? And, and, if, and if I see the game is telling me, is, is wanting me to go north, well, I go south. Because there's this part of me that goes, okay, well, I want to see how the, how the designer dealt with me going the wrong direction, yeah. right? And oftentimes it's like, you know, you hit a glass wall, right? Or you hit, you know, some weird artificial there, construct. There's, there's a bush that's about knee high right, that, that we you could can't never jump possibly over. jump over. Right, right. And so, so I'm, you know, I'm always curious about that stuff. And so when I played the Stanley Parables, that was the first thing I did. Right, I, I went in the opposite direction, and the game reacted to me. Do you see now? Do you see that Stanley was already dead from the moment he hit start? 
whoa, wait a minute. I, I was trying to do what you didn't want me to do, and it kind of was what you wanted me to do anyway. And that just really blew my mind. Yeah, so my advice to, to up and coming game designers and developers is, is chase the weird stuff, because that's where the interesting things are. What do you want to do for the rest of the day? Eat sushi and play games. <laughs> the weirdest answer we've had today. I would want to um, eat sushi, tacos, pizza, and donuts. Tacos for dinner? I think they're hungry, Mom and Dad. <laughs> <laughs>